Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. This time we'll be doing the novel Blind Sight by Peter Watts, which was published in 2006. In this universe, human society has begun to fragment. Technology has advanced to the point where entire groups of people now live out their lives in virtual environments of their own making for the price of the company using their subconscious for whatever it wants their conscious mind will live out its entire life in a virtual reality there are others who live out their entire lives as part of a hive mind others have augmented themselves becoming cyborgs so they can do their jobs more efficiently add to the mix that the birth rate is dropping drastically and then we have the vampires in this universe, vampires are a subspecies of Homo sapiens. The vampire subspecies existed about 500,000 years ago and have since died out. The vampire genome was rediscovered accidentally while trying to find a cure for autism in a young boy. Experimental gene therapy was given to this boy and it accidentally kick-started dormant genes that led to the rediscovery of the vampire. The kid of course died, but the company that had conducted the experiments quickly got Texas to give them access to their death row inmates so they can experiment on. Named Homo sapiens vampiris, they evolved to prey on regular humans. They have superior vision, are stronger and faster, and their eyes have four types of cones that give them nocturnal vision similar to cats and snakes. They are more suited for carnivorous diet and since cannibalism carries a high risk of prionic infection, their immune system has a great resistance to prion diseases. And they are more intelligent than humans just as most predators are more intelligent than their prey. They prey almost exclusively on humans because they have lost the ability to synthesize a protein that exists almost exclusively in hominids. Prey always outbreed the predators, but in this case, regular humans do not outbreed vampires. So in order to keep from hunting humans to extinction, the vampires developed a dormancy phase like the lungfish that can last for decades, giving the human population a chance to rebuild. The vampires died out when humans developed architecture. When they see intersecting right angles, which are non-existent in nature, it causes them to go into seizures that kill them. The company that brought these vampires back thought that it would be a good idea to bring them back and put them in charge of figuring things out and solving problems because they were that much smarter than humans. They developed a drug that the vampires will have to take periodically to keep from having seizures. That way, they figured they could control them. The story is narrated by C.V. Keaton. He's a synthesis, a person that can read others' intentions and interpret their actions. He's there to do that to the crew and report back to Earth. When he was a boy, he used to have violent seizures, so they had one entire hemisphere of his brain cut out. After that, he grew less emotional and more distant. He began to observe others and mimic the appropriate behaviors that others expected from him. One day in February of 2082, after he and his father had just finished visiting their mother, who was now an inhabitant of a virtual reality world, this was the last time they were going to see her physical body. Every other visit after that would be virtual. When they left and stepped out on the street, that was when the firefall event happened. 65,536 objects of unknown origin simultaneously hit the atmosphere. They converged in a precise longitudinal and latitudinal grid. They all burnt up in the upper atmosphere. And just before they did, each object emitted a strong omnidirectional radio signal. They were not detected on approach and no fragments or samples of any kind were found afterward. The belief is that Earth was surveyed by an unknown agency 
whether it was friendly or hostile, was unknown. In April of 2082, a French deep space cometary survey probe intercepted an unidentified light beam radio signal that was sweeping the sky periodically. The signal was traced to a Kuiper Belt object that was subsequently named Burns Caulfield. Two high velocity probes were sent on a flyby to investigate. They detected a subsurface artifact that was made from refined iron. Those probes were called the first wave. Three more better equipped probes that were called the second wave was sent to do a high resolution survey on the object. At the same time, Siri found out that he was chosen as the synthesis to be on a trip to go and visit the Burns Caulfield and it's been fast tracked. He headed out on a ship called the Theseus in 2083 heading for the Burns Caulfield. Meanwhile, the second wave reaches it and begins an in-depth scan. Then on December 2nd, 2084, once it detected their scan, it blew itself up. In the belief that the Burns Caulfield comet was a diversion, they began to look in the sky directly opposite of where it was located in hopes of finding whatever they were being diverted from. And since the Theseus was already on its way out, they put it in a standby cometary trajectory until they could reroute it. Their search turned up something. It was either a large gas giant or a small brown dwarf. Its mass was over 10 Jupiters and it was half a light year from Earth in the Oort cloud. The Theseus was diverted and five years later it got there. The first team was pulled out of hibernation and four hours later Sarasti, the vampire who is the exec on the ship, briefed them. They were still a little way from the planet that Mission Control is now calling Big Ben. Sarasti told them that something from the planet pinged them about 4 hours and 48 minutes before and they responded with an identical signal and that the probe was launched a half hour before they woke up. They moved in closer to the planet. As they got close, they were able to see the emission spectrum and they saw that it came from Canis Major. Ben was from outside the Milky Way. They followed their probe closer. A day on Ben lasted 7 hours and 12 minutes. As the probe got in close, it got fried from the magnetic field. As they got closer, they realized that what they first thought was meteorites that was in orbit around Ben was actually machines. There were 400,000 of them, Von Neumann machines, using raw materials from the accretion belt. As they got closer still, they realized that there was something down in Ben's equator that was just low enough to grace the atmosphere every 40 hours, something they couldn't see, something most of the instruments was not picking up. And whatever it was, not only was it tracking them, but it was big, about 30 kilometers from side to side. When they noticed it and began heading straight to it, that's when it contacted them via laser and began speaking with them. The woman they called a gang of four was the one tasked with speaking with the aliens. She had four distinct personalities. Susan James was the original personality. Michelle, Sasha, and Cruncher was a male. He acted as a data processing facility for the rest of them. The alien ship called itself Rorschach. Susan James and her three personalities had decoded and answered the signal within three minutes. She had done that to herself to achieve this kind of performance. So for four hours they spoke to Rorschach. It spoke human languages. It expressed concern for their welfare and their safety. But for four hours it managed to avoid giving a straight answer in any subject except that it wouldn't be advisable for closer contact. After four hours, its orbit took it to the other side of Ben, and they lost contact. They put parabolic mirrors up in orbit that would be there temporarily. They would last there for a little while until the Rorschach came back around. They wanted to be able to see through the Rorschach's stealth. Using the mirrors, they realized that Rorschach was using Ben's accretion disc debris 
to grow and watching it grow and how it grew proved that it was more intelligent than vampires and quantum computers. Once Rorschach began talking to them again, Susan began testing Rorschach and she came to the conclusion that Rorschach didn't understand what it was saying. It was using pattern matching algorithms to participate in the conversation without having any idea of what it was saying. Once Rorschach went around Ben again, they prepared themselves. They prepared a probe that they would use to get close to Rorschach and the Theseus would actually go down and follow the probe. They used the probe to get a good look at the Rorschach's magnetic field, which was stronger than the sun. As the probe got closer, the Rorschach began demanding that they answer and warning them off. As the probe got closer, they were finally able to see the Rorschach as it really looked. It looked like a crown of thorns, twisted, unreflective, and tickly tangled. It was about the size of a city. Lightning arced from spines that was a thousand meters long. The Rorschach then said, now it's too late. Now every last one of you is dead. They were now so close to Ben that they could hardly see the curvature of the planet anymore. The probe that they called Jack had landed on Rorschach's ridged surface using feet that were similar to a gecko's. Rorschach's skin was 60% superconducting carbon nanotube. Most of Rorschach's insides was hollow and in some of those hollows were an atmosphere that was poisonous to earthly life. There was radiation and electromagnetic forces that surrounded it and was inside it. In some places on the inside, the radiation was so strong it would turn flesh to ash instantly. They looked but couldn't find any airlocks or hatches or viewports. There was a nanofabrication plant in the Theseus and Major Bates was using it to create grunts which were armored, squashed, egg-shaped and twice the size of a human torso with antennae optical ports, retractable shred saws, and weapons. The Theseus set up an orbit that matched the Rorschachs and brought them within striking distance for three hours. They set up a tent on Rorschach's skin and burned through. The hole was pencil thin and the probe sent in a wire to look around. The sensor that the probe sent through the hole got fried, so they had the probe widen the hole until it was a meter across, and then they outfitted the grunts and shielded them and then sent them in. Each one that went through trailed a fiber optic cable behind it to send back info. The probes all died after sending back a few minutes of information. They sent more probes, but no matter how they tried to shield them, they all ended up dying. So Rusty then decided to send all four crew members into the Rorschach along with two grunts. They all hopped into one of two shuttlecrafts on the Theseus, the Skylar, and headed over to the Rorschach. Once they were in the Rorschach, a magnetic spike hit and they began to hallucinate, but they all made it back into the shuttle. By the time they got back to the Theseus, they were beginning to be affected by radiation sickness. But the Theseus had the ability to cure their radiation sickness. So once they got back inside, they stripped down naked and went into the crypt where the coffins lay and got inside and it put them to sleep. And when they woke up, they were cured of their radiation sickness. Five times they went into the Rorschach, enduring the radiation sickness and the magnetic induced hallucinations. The sixth time that they went into the raw shack, it finally reacted. It closed off a tunnel, trapping the gang of four on one side. And then, as they used lasers to try and cut through to get to her, it sent reflectors that sent the laser light back at them, killing Spindel in the process. The Theseus had nine people on it. There was four that was kept awake and four that was kept in storage, just in case one of the main four died. Sarasti was the only one who didn't have a replacement. Robert Cunningham was Spindel's replacement. Once they played back the recording that was taken while they were on the Rorschach, Sarasti, with his better vision, noticed that there was something else down there with them. Sarasti had them try an experiment. 
to blow away the tent that was hiding the hole in the Rorschach skin to see what would happen. But the Rorschach just healed itself. So Rusty sent them back again. This time they went to a different part of the Rorschach and blasted their way through. This time they came into a tunnel that had lights and seemed to have a fog in it. This time there were three of them, Bates, the Gang of Four and Siri, and each one of them had a grunt with them. This time they sedated three of the four personalities in the Gang of Four, leaving Sasha as the only one awake. Once inside, they came to a room that had a dozen tunnels going off into different directions. They split up and each one along with its grunt took a different tunnel. They had 25 minutes before they had to be out of the Rorschach. Siri went down his tunnel with his grunt. About 20 meters in, he began to see what he thought was hallucinations. When he tried to report it, suddenly communications cut out. He saw his grunt pointing its gun in his direction. Communications came back and Bates and Sasha was telling him that there was something right in front of him, but he couldn't see it. But when the gang and Bates came round the corner, suddenly he could see it. He tried to escape by climbing the roof of the tunnel, but the grunts shot it. It looked like a multi-armed starfish. They grabbed it and took it back to the Theseus. Cunningham, who was the biologist, couldn't tell very much about it because they had fried it with a microwave gun, but he assumed it was unintelligent. They had to go back and get a live one. So they went back and opened up a breach right on top of where the aliens were located, and they had set a trap hoping the aliens would chase them, which they did, and they captured two of them. But it was a close thing. They gave the aliens the name Scramblers. They brought them back to the Theseus and put them in cages next to each other. At first, they believed that they were unintelligent because they didn't have brains, but that was until the gang of four realized that they were using their arms to tap out messages to each other at very high speeds. They had to slow down the video and audio to even notice. Cunningham was reluctant to admit that they were intelligent, but he was the one that ended up naming them, Stretch and Clinch. In order to get them to communicate, they began negative reinforcement. In the Gang of Four, Susan took the lead in this operation, and it worked. And they proved that these scramblers were smart, very intelligent, in fact, more intelligent than humans and possibly more intelligent than the vampires. All they could figure out was that they talked through pigmentation, but they couldn't break the language. They didn't have genes. They used turin morphogens. Rorschach's magnetic field was part of their life support system, and without it, they're dying. They built a cage and pushed it out the front of the Theseus, as close to the Rorschach as they could, and in it they placed the two scramblers, getting it into the magnetic field of the Rorschach, hoping that that would keep the scramblers alive. And then they built two guns and pointed it at the cage. They would destroy the cage and kill the scramblers if they have to. They couldn't afford to let them escape. Cunningham figured out why Siri couldn't see the scrambler when he was on the Rorschach. It turns out that scramblers can see when your nerves are firing and move between the gap making them seem invisible. But once the other members of the crew showed up, it stopped working because nobody's nerves fires in sync. Cunningham figured out that Rorschach and the scramblers are highly intelligent, more intelligent than humans and vampires. The scramblers they caught were not specimens, but were spies that was allowed to be caught. Cunningham was afraid. He now felt that they were outmatched, but Sarasti had a plan and it was to attack. Then Sarasti called Siri to his quarters. And while there, he attacked him. He obviously wasn't trying to kill him, just torture him. As Siri slowly recovered from his beating, no one came to him, no one talked with him. It seems that Sarasti was trying to force him to stop being an observer and to begin participating and thinking on the role of consciousness and self-awareness. Are they needed or are they a burden? So when Siri came out and began talking to members of the crew, he finally realized that the Rorschach and the Scramblers 
are intelligent but not self-aware or have any consciousness. The Rorschach and the Scramblers came across our signals beaming out into space and when they decoded them they held no intelligent information. They were structured intelligently so there was no chance that they could have arisen by chance. That meant that something coded nonsense as a useful message that the signal functioned to consume resources of a recipient for zero payoff. The signal was a virus. Viruses do not arise from allies. The signal was an attack. So they began looking for where the signals came from and then began preparations to destroy an enemy. Before Surasti could put his plan into action, the Rorschach attacked, hitting the Theseus with a bolt of plasma. The Theseus immediately used its guns to kill the two scramblers that were outside in a cage. Looking at the Rorschach, they could see that scramblers was coming out and trying to get pieces of the dead scramblers. Even though they were dead, they could still download information from them. Surasti sent two of the crew out to get what remained of the scramblers and bring them back in. While Siri and Cunningham were out getting the samples, scramblers crossed over from the Rorschach and captured Cunningham and Siri was able to escape back to the ship. That's when the Rorschach hit them with a second shot. The shot did not destroy anything, but it did weaken the Theseus' spine. Surasti put the gang of four back into her coffin because she was no longer needed and called Siri into his quarters. He explained to Siri that he did it because he wanted Siri to stop being an observer and be a participant because when he goes back, he needs to be able to convince the people of Earth of the danger. Siri was the one he selected to survive and to carry a warning back. At this point, Rosha came out from behind Ben and began its attack by sending up skimmers, the Van Neumann machines. At this point, Sarasti grabbed Siri and headed towards the shuttle Charybdis. As it was headed down towards the shuttle, a voice announced that Susan James had barricaded herself in the bridge and shut down automatic overrides and that she had initiated an unauthorized burn and it was shutting down the reactor. That was the voice of the captain, the AI that actually was in charge of the mission. Just then, Surazzi began to convulse. He was having a seizure. As Siri began pushing Surazzi towards the infirmary, they could see on the monitors that the Rorschach was coming up out of Ben. While he was distracted, one of the grunts came up and plunged something into the base of Surazzi's skull. Bates came out and told Siri that the scramblers were attacking in waves. She left and went with her grunts to fight the borders, while Surazzi, now dead, was being controlled by the captain, the AI. When Siri asked the AI why it killed Surasti, it said he was seizing and it couldn't control him. As Siri got into the shuttle, he asked, was it ever him? Did he ever speak for himself? Did he ever decide anything on his own? Or were we just following your orders to him? Using a hand pad, Surazzi's dead fingers typed out, you dislike orders from machines, happier this way. It strapped him in and closed the hatch and the shuttle took off headed back towards Earth. He knew that they had turned the Theseus into a big antimatter bomb. The Theseus was dropping down to meet the Rorschach as the Rorschach was coming up to meet the Theseus and the Rorschach was pulling Ben's magnetic sphere around it, creating a one big magnetic cannon. See, we didn't see what happened because Ben got in the way just before the explosion. The explosion was so bright that Ben looked like a coin held against the sun. The Theseus sent everything it could right up to the end. Siri would lie in stasis for most of the journey home, which would take longer than the journey out. He would wake up every so often along the trip to give his body time to heal so that he doesn't just corrode while in stasis. 
14 years into his trip home, he received a message from his father. His father had sent an omnidirectional signal, hoping that he would receive it. His mother Helen was dead. It seems that heaven, the virtual reality system that she was in, malfunctioned or was sabotaged. And his father seems to believe he knows who was responsible. From the radio messages he's been listening to while awake, he thinks that the vampires have taken over and began killing baseline humans, humans that have not been augmented in any way. And that by the time he gets back, he might be the last human alive, the last conscious being alive. And he's not even sure of himself. And that's how the book ends. This story was told in a narrative style by Siri. You learn about his life and what made him what he is. So the whole story is Siri narrating what happened while he is on his way back to Earth. There is a sequel to this book, or more appropriately called a sequel, because the events in that sequel happens at the same time as the events in this book. Anyway, I want to thank you for watching and listening, and subscribe if you haven't, give us a thumbs up, and drop a comment, and I will see you in the next video.